What's going on, at your boy Apollos, and I'm here to update y'all on my lack of activity over the past year or so. It's just that I've had particular personal problems in life that compounded over fall 2023 that resulted in me not being able to focus on content creation. Furthermore, I've had a little bit of a realization that some version of biblical inspiration was ascertainable in my view. Um, in light of God's miraculous interventions in history surrounding the narratives of the biblical texts. For those of you who have been here for a while, you may have previously known me as your not-so-chad or famous liberal Christian from my previous videos. After attending ETS or EPS 2023 in San Antonio over here, uh, Marcus Ross is the only young earth creationist whose intellectual caliber I probably will ever respect. I've shifted my position to be a little bit more conservative in acknowledging the usefulness of the maximal data trend for arguing for Jesus' resurrection including acknowledging that the canonical gospels as we have them are reliable eyewitness testimonies from the apostles as they are traditionally ascribed to, and recognize the Deutero-Pauline epistles as inspired scripture. Uh, shout out to the work of content creators like Inspiring Philosophy and the work of scholars like Richard Balcom and his Jesus and the Eyewitnesses and Sandra Glenn's reconciliation of Paul's apparent misogynistic theology. I do have some doubts regarding some traditionalist literalist interpretations of scripture, including the ecclesiastical value of apocalyptic texts like Daniel and Revelation. So yeah, to the best of my knowledge of many critical scholars, those texts, just like many of the apocalyptic literature of the Second Temple, were heavily influenced by the surrounding contemporaneous cultural context, including Daniel's imminent apocalyptic vision and Neronian persecution. That didn't happen. Antiochus IV never took all of Egypt. He never took Ethiopia. He never took Libya. He died way over in Babylon. This author doesn't know the end of the story. He gets everything right up to 167 and everything wrong at 164. Daniel is one of the earliest cases of what we call apocalyptic literature. This is how we date apocalyptic literature. Where do they get the history right? Oh man. And then when does the history... Ripdale Martin, yo. I don't exactly think that the pastorals are pseudepigraphic per se, as opposed to them being private correspondences, perhaps written by someone from the Pauline School of Thought, taking liberties in implementing church structure in localized areas to their preference. This is how an illiterate person like James or Peter um, could have authored an epistle without ever writing anything with their own hand. But all that being said, I don't see this necessarily as in direct conflict with what I define as a high view of scripture. God can choose to show himself through very real truths and characteristics of himself via themes and motifs, patterns and trends found in either historical or fictional texts. So while I haven't crunched the numbers to see if I could sign something like Chicago's Statement of Inerrancy, which cannot refer, by the way, to every jot or tittle, Jesus was referring to the Old Testament that was about to be fulfilled, as opposed to textual corruption anyway. I do think that I could uphold these three doctrines if defined as follows. 1. The Spirit inspired the biblical authors to write divine truths, literal or non-literal, intended or not intended, aka inspiration. While the original linguistics can reveal some divine truth in the Bible, we need to recognize that gospels and books like John are not literal transcripts when many of the conversations are either translations or simply do not go back to an original word-for-word -word historical conversation in Aramaic. Anywho, Harold Atteridge argues that there is some genre bending over there compared to the synoptics. Two, that we can ascertain the autographs with a high degree of certainty, inerrancy, without having to believe something as ridiculous as there are no textual variants in the Bible, or any ancient document for that matter. For example, the three different endings of Mark's Gospel or the Pericope Adultery in John 8. Three, that whatever truth is revealed, and only four, what the Spirit claims for itself, be it literal or non-literal, intended or not intended, it does not err in its most fundamental essence. Infallible. I don't have to deny the simplest explanation of Paul making reference to the seventh heaven or Jesus saying that the mustard seed is the smallest seed, being simply that they were men of their own time that had erroneous scientific views of cosmology and biology, but yet still had divine truth. I can recognize that Paul is just perhaps referring to the flat earth dome cosmology of the ancient Near Eastern peoples. 
So how do you know what the inerrant truth is in the Bible versus the more mythical and fictional elements that surround it? Well, quite frankly, that's what we're here for. Uh, because the way you determine that is that you study. We're here to equip you on how to do that. So TLDR, this channel, while still being academically critical, will lean just a little bit more right towards conservative avenues in defending the gospel. For those of you who still stayed as subscribers waiting for me to come back, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the continued support and love. Stick around for some more upcoming video projects and a revamping of Ratio Christie at ETSA. In the meantime, this is Atchaboy Paul signing out. Peace.